Hello church, today's message is about the means of grace, what it is and how we need to practice it. I love to relate the illustration of a spouse who gives a gift to the other spouse on the wedding anniversary. The other spouse is moved deeply by the gift and says, oh, you shouldn't have. And the spouse responds by saying, oh, I should. It's my duty as your spouse. Well, talk about a crash and burn. The whole point has been missed. The whole meaning of the anniversary has been defined as an act of obligation and duty. And the living, breathing, dynamic relationship of the marriage is curved aside. But what if the other spouse said, when the other spouse says, oh, you shouldn't have, the spouse says, I'm so thankful for you. This is only a small measure of my heart. Oh, how that would highlight the dynamic love between the two. And such interaction opens up and yields the both to be positioned to receive and give love. Today's teaching, John chapter 15, verse 1 through 11, takes place after the Lord's Supper, after the washing of the disciples' feet. Jesus was preparing his disciples for his upcoming suffering, death, and resurrection. He was preparing them to receive the Holy Spirit. And in the midst of that, he says, abide in me. Another way to put it is remain in me. It's the Greek word meno, which means to place. Jesus is saying, place yourself, position yourself, tarry, stay, stay with Jesus, stay in Jesus. Why? How? Why? Jesus says that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. Now, our Christian journey is about growing in grace. It's about growing more and more into the image of Christ. It's the image of Christ that is realized increasingly in your life. It's as though you're looking at a spiritual mirror. And what you see day to day is increasingly more like the image of Jesus Christ. Just as there are visible changes and growth to children who are growing, and especially those years of growth spurts that happen out of nowhere, and these are visible signs of growth. But in order to grow, we must eat well, exercise well, and rest well. Now, doing those things don't cause the growth to happen. It doesn't enable the growth mechanism. I mean, the growth mechanism is there by the creative power of God. And sure, there is a function of the pituitary gland and the rest of the bodily functions that God created. And science measures and tells us if these things are functioning well. But it is by God's design and gracious work that children grow year to year. And eating well, exercising well, rest, resting well, these things position children for optimal, optimally position them to grow. Our Christian journey is similar to that. We're called to grow in grace. But what do we do to grow in grace? Christian tradition offers us this idea called means of grace. Now, John Wesley didn't come up with it, but he did incorporate it and was a major advocate for it and made it a primary part of discipleship in the Methodist movement. It is still a hallmark of Methodist discipleship. Well, in order to understand means of grace, let's take a look at what grace is all about. What is grace? I was recently in a conversation defining grace. Here's an illustration. Mercy is a king giving a homeless person a coat, but grace is a king looking at the homeless person and making that person a co-heir to the throne. In other words, you put them in your will. Grace is inviting a homeless person into your home and giving them the master bedroom, all rights to everything you have, the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the car you drive, and then giving them equal rights to your estate, as your children do. Grace is scandalous, isn't it? And, and it is this grace that, that is the heartbeat of Christians. It's what Christians look it's what we live, eat, and breathe. It's so, so good, so good that when you wake up, you search for it. Grace cannot be confused with compassion or pity or feeling sorry or being kind or nice or gentle. Grace is costly to the one who gives it. And, and this is where grace becomes so stumbling to so many Christians because it's so extravagant. It's so lavish and it must be received and, and experienced. For the Christian, grace is everything. Now, John Wesley believed that grace, the love of God, and the Holy Spirit, they go together. Grace cannot be earned. Grace cannot be manufactured. 
Grace cannot be conceived in our minds. Grace cannot be forced. It must be received. It is given to us through the love of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. According to John Wesley, grace must be experienced. It can't just be fathomed. Grace is a a lived out experience of God. It's not just this nice idea, uh, a concept or a principle. It is the experience of God's utterly amazing, incomparable, unparalleled, unmerited favor that lavishes his love on you, positions you as eternally in right standing, and God's great awesome salvation given to you, as well as providing provisions for you on this temporal earth. But we won't really know that until we see that it did not come to us at any cost. But in the absolute poverty of our soul, Jesus was given to us. What grace is that? That we become beneficiaries to the unlimited riches of heaven. God's great, awesome salvation. Grace is scandalous. Now the word scandalous means causing general public outrage by a perceived offense against morality or law. Grace is is scandalous. Why? Well, Jesus is scandalous, isn't he? He he caused the general public outrage among the upright, the religious, the righteous Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law. It caused his arrest, his suffering, his death on the cross. And even then, even after all that, he resurrected and gave forgiveness and salvation. Grace goes against everything a moralistic religious person stands for. It is quite outrageous and shocking. If grace does not leave you in shock and awe, speechless, so deeply moved, then it's not grace. And that's why John Newton wrote, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And Charles Wesley wrote, And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? And if grace is this scandalous, then the means of grace is also scandalous. And if we're not experiencing a scandalous measure of grace from God, then we cannot show it or share it with others. Then we are just offering leftover grace, or forcing grace according to the principles that we think are grace. And it simply doesn't work that way. We we can't give what we don't have. Now, John Wesley, the way he explained what means of grace is that it's outward symbols, words, and actions that God ordained that might convey to us grace, prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying grace. Now, if you remember the message a couple weeks ago, the varieties of grace, You know, I talked about the different types of grace that we believe in as Methodists. But the journey of grace we have mapped out in our Wesleyan tradition is preparing grace, convincing grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace, perfecting and glorifying grace. The entire journey is an invitation to encounter God's goodness through Jesus Christ and to cause us to become a holy people, a scriptural people, a people in love with Jesus. And church tradition and history has shown us that the three things that church has experienced most grace through is scripture, prayer, and the Lord's Supper. John Wesley believed that the chief means of grace are exactly that, prayer, whether you do it in secret or with a large congregation. Searching the scriptures, which implies reading, hearing, and meditating on the Bible. Receiving the Lord's Supper, eating bread and drinking wine in remembrance of Christ. We we believe that these means are ordained by God to be the channels of conveying His grace to us. A scripture, you know, before you figure out what you're supposed to do as Christians, you're spending time learning about what Christ has done and, and the benefits of what Christ has done. What Christ has done for you and for me. Prayer, prosukomai, the Greek word for exchange of wills, exchange of thoughts. What is the will of God? Prayer reveals that the will of God is Jesus Christ. And communion, holy communion. Jesus Christ enfleshed among us in the holy mystery of the bread and wine. It reminds me of the the road to Emmaus. The two disciples, their eyes were opened after receiving communion and they recognized Jesus. In fact, it's not just communion, it's the scriptures, the prayer, and communion. Luke 24, verse 30 to 32. When he, Jesus, was at table with, at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, he prayed, and broke it and gave to them, holy communion. And their eyes were open and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And you know what happened? 
These two disciples, they ran back the seven miles they traveled, all the way back to Jerusalem. And that's what the experience of grace does. You can't hold it in. You've got to go back and tell somebody. The good news about the means of grace is that it gets even better. It's not just limited to those three chief means of grace. Beyond those three are just the many other things that we do actively, proactively to avail ourselves, to yield ourselves, to experience the grace of God, to surrender ourselves. You can experience the grace of God while serving. It's not just while going and doing worship. You can, while serving, while doing missions, you can experience the grace of God. You can experience the grace of God while in fellowship with one another, with another brother or sister in Christ. In fact, John Wesley divided all the Christian actions we do into two categories, and these are all means of grace. First is works of piety, and the second is works of mercy. Works of piety is the category of the things that we do that deepen and develop our inward, introspective spirituality. And then works of mercy is the things that we do that broaden and expand our outward spirituality. So, for example, works of piety is our public worship of God, like we're gathered right now and worshiping. Reading of, of God's word, your daily devotions or Bible study. Holy communion, family and private prayer, searching the scriptures, Bible study, fasting or abstinence, just really removing yourself from things so you can focus on God. Christian conferencing, which is another way of fellowship. And then there's works of mercy, and these were common in John Wesley's day, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, visiting those in prison, sheltering the homeless, welcoming the stranger, peacemaking, serving the common good, and they're common today. So if you want to grow inwardly deep, you need to get into the practice of works of piety. If you want to grow outwardly expansive, you need to get into the practice of works of mercy, and we got to do both. An inwardly pious person with no outward engagement of serving and giving and helping and doing missions is very narrow in scope. An outwardly engaged person, but without any inward piety, is often shallow in depth. Most importantly is this. Not only do we have to do these two things, but the means of grace is not an end to itself. Nor is it a means for anything other than the amazing grace of God. In fact, John Wesley believed that the means of grace separated from the goal of experiencing God's grace, they are less than nothing and emptiness. Well, get this. If, he says this. He says, if the means of grace do not promote the knowledge and love of God, they are not acceptable in his sight. Wow. Indeed, they are instead an abomination to God, a stench in his nostrils, and he is furious against them. Above all, if we use the means of grace as a kind of substitute for the religion they were designed to serve, it's not easy to find words to describe the enormous absurdity and wickedness of turning God's means against himself. In this way, we banish Christianity from the heart by the very means that God ordained for bringing it into the heart. Means of grace, the purpose of it is to receive grace. We could be doing all the good and religious things that are helpful and are, are considered good, but if it's not done in a way to receive the grace of God, it becomes meaningless. Why? Because we have to remember, the purpose of Methodism is to spread scriptural holiness, one person at a time, to become more and more holy according to God's scripture, set apart into a people of faith, believing in God and trusting in God and, and standing upon his word and being a people of prayer and serving people and helping and, and spreading the gospel. That is evangelism and gospel transmission, gospel transformation. That's the purpose of Methodism. That's the, that's the purpose of church. And so in order to do this, in order to do this, our means of grace is so vital. We need to be a people full and overflowing with the incredible grace of God. To be a people so full of grace, we need the means of grace. We need to make sure that we are part of a ministry that enables us to grow deep in the word and in the practice of prayer. We need to make sure that we are participating in a ministry that enables us, challenges us, inspires us to help those who are in the least, the last, and the lost, which translates to those who are without, those who are oppressed, and those who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. 
Do you know people who are in the category of the least, the last, and the lost? We all do. For us to reach such dear people with the gospel of Christ, we must be wholly engaged into the means of grace. What will we offer if we are not growing in grace? Church, grace is so good. So good. So Charles Wesley finishes the hymn, And Can It Be, with these lines, and I close with this. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for, oh my God, it found out me. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. No condemnation, now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine, alive in him my living head. And clothed in righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Church, let's engage our faculties, our time and our strength, our energy into receiving wondrous grace. Go in and do works of piety and works of mercy for the purpose of becoming saturated in the grace of God. So as to, to flow in his grace and, and transform the world around you with his amazing grace. Amen. Amen, church.